Welcome back to the channel. Another great episode today on routing slips and some of the features I've talked about in previous episodes. If you're just joining, this is the first video you're watching, I recommend to go to the playlist, should be linked in the card, and start from the beginning, because I really cover this entire demo and how routing slips are built, the capabilities are there, a lot of background. Today I'm gonna talk about dynamic routing slips, and I'm also gonna throw in a little error handling, you know, how to do retry and redelivery. So with that, I've got the existing solution open, and I'm gonna cover dynamic routing slips. Now, the registration flow that we have, I tried to think of an activity that I could add that might be conditional. And what I came up with is the event registration activity. Let's say that if this is a dangerous event, I want to actually make them sign a waiver. So I'm going to go to some external waiver service, whether that's like a, a ninja sign, DocuSign type thing that they have to go out and they have to sign and that that site is going to send them the email make them and go and sign and things like that and i'll manage that externally but i need to add that activity to the routing slip because i want that to happen and in this case i want it to happen after the payment has been approved because if the payment fails i don't want them to sign a waiver for an event they aren't registered for so i created a new assign waiver activity it uses that same participant email address and just says it's assigning a waiver to you know, so and so, and it will actually create a failure if you ask, you know, if it's Joey, Joey's like, yeah, you know, I'm not going to sign. So it would throw an exception. The arguments are the email address and the event ID, which just come in from those variables that are already in the routing slip. So no new arguments to add. Everything is already there uh, and everything's cool there. Um, now, if we remember at the beginning, the only place I actually create the routing slip activities is in the process registration consumer. You can see I add the license verification, event registration, and process payment. And to do that, I previously had a method in here that was creating the execute activity address. Well, that because that behavior needs to be used across the system, I extracted that out into my own little endpoint address provider, which uses the endpoint name formatter to execute, to get the execute activity address. And I'm using that now in the event registration activity to revise that itinerary and add that additional activity at the end of the routing slip. So we can see in here, if I have that danger flag, I'm going, instead of calling completed with variables, which to avoid duplication, I've created my log and my variables as separate, um, local variables in the system in this function and then if it starts with danger i'm going to call revise itinerary instead of completed with variables and revise itinerary has an overload that takes the log it takes the variables and then it takes an itinerary builder which allows me to build a new itinerary and it's important to point out that this is a brand new itinerary if i put nothing in here it kind of ends because the routing slip would be done at that point it would be completed um, I don't recommend you do that. There's actually a terminate uh, method as well that can be used to terminate a routing slip and throw away all remaining activities. And that's useful because the terminate event actually includes the activities that were not executed. Um, but I'm going to revise this because I want to add an activity. So the first thing I'm going to do is because I said I wanted to add this activity at the end of the routing slip, I'm going to add the activities from the source itinerary. And all this does is copy everything that was left, you know, the remaining activities to the front of the itinerary. Now I'm going to add that assign waiver. I'm going to get the execute endpoint using that same provider of that assign waiver activity. And because there's no special arguments for this one, I don't need to pass any additional information. If I did need to, I would put a new here and pass those arguments. At this point, that's going to return and complete this activity with that revised routing slip going forward. So let's see what this looks like when we actually run it. And because we have Jaeger from the previous episode, we'll be able to watch the trace and see how that activity comes in. So we know how the basic functionality works. I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna change this to danger and I'm gonna execute that. And now if I come back in here and look, I can actually see that I am registered, but I wanna see the path that that took. So I'm gonna come in here, I'm gonna find traces. And I can see that I now have a 29 step registration in here. 
and the call stack gets deep. You can see it buried in here. But we can see the event registration executed, the process payment executed, and then the assign waiver executed. So we can see that that activity ran at the end of the routing slip, giving us that additional um, activity to go out and assign the waiver to that race participant. Um, so that's pretty cool. A quick aside on like Jaeger, that's kind of cool. You can actually look at the trace statistics because that call stack gets pretty deep. But you can see where most of the time is spent. In this case, it's in the registration service. And what's kind of nice is you can actually, I think it's the graph? No, not that. Although that is very uh, interesting in terms of the flow. Yeah, that's pretty cool. It tells you where everything's at. There was, oh, shoot. There was one other one I wanted to look at. And that was the, is it the spans table? Yes. And I think I can group by, maybe it's trace statistics. Group by service name, I can group by operation name. And here I can actually see what the most expensive operations are in my trace. So I can look and see that, oh, the event registration execute seems to take the longest amount of time. And it could just be that there's a longer delay, it's sending more messages, who knows. But the statistics we get out of that is really great for finding bottlenecks. Anyway, just an aside on that, just Open telemetry is awesome for finding things in your system and getting that visibility. So that's the ability to dynamically change the routing slip based on content. You know, I've used this in other systems. We had a system that had a fast and a slow path. And the way the fast path worked is that we would actually get identifiers of like, this is a customer number. And we would also have like demographic data of the customer, like email address, first name, last name, zip code, stuff like that. And what we found is sometimes those identifiers weren't valid. So we would actually inject an activity into the routing slip to go out and find that, um, find that, uh, that customer using the demographic data, like their location, customer name, stuff like that. And then we would, after that activity executed, we would have the identifiers and we would continue the routing slip where it left off. So that was just an example where we injected one in the middle that was super cool, and that's why that capability was built. So the next piece I'm gonna cover is how we do, um, how we deal with exceptions in an activity. So let me jump over to that and see where we can go from there. So as we can see in this process payment activity, I've added some additional features. So like if the card number is 187, I'm going to check and see if I've been retried. And if I've not been retried yet, I'm gonna throw a transient exception. And then if I haven't been redelivered, I'm gonna throw a long transient exception. So I've, I've added just some simulation of a payment provider not being available because I wanna see how I can retry and redeliver Act, the routing slip back to this activity the same way we would retry a consumer or a message to a saga. So this is just to simulate some exceptions. I'm going to go into the tester and I'm going to put my card number as 187. And now I am going to execute this. And let's do it without the waiver requirement to start. So I'm going to hit send. I'm going to go out here. I'm, gonna, I'm actually just going to jump straight into the Jaeger trace because why not? You can see it a little bit more visibly. And we can see that we have the process payment execute, promise payment process, but then we have the payment sending it back to itself. That is that redelivery. So if we go out and look at the actual debug log, we can see that in the processing of this, we had some retry filter execution, we had some warnings, we had warnings, we had warnings on top of warnings. And this is just the log saying, hey, this happened, I'm gonna go retry. Okay, I'm gonna retry. At some point we re-delivered, because right now I think my log level is information, so you don't see that. But at some point we wrote the message back out to the transport and said, hey, re-deliver this after a certain interval and then the activity was able to ultimately complete because you know, I staged those 
those different values based on retry attempt. And we can see that through the redelivery here, I sent it back to myself, and that gives us that extra jump. There's also a delay of about 500 milliseconds between the first and the last, so we can kind of see how that goes. I configured that retry in the program CS by using a configure endpoints callback, and this is gonna be applied to every single endpoint. So every endpoint is gonna have this, this recovery. I could filter that out using these other parameters like name and stuff, or I could use an activity definition you know, on the endpoint to make it for a specific activity. So I have two pieces in here. The first one is just use message retry, and that's on the inner loop because I wanna retry first in memory before I go out and push to using delayed redelivery, because delayed redelivery is gonna actually put it back on the transport and redeliver it at a future time. So I handle the transient exception with just a quick interval, and that's those quick retries that we see right away. I handle delayed redelivery through this long transient exception, which is that second exception I throw if I've already been retried but not redelivered. And that's actually gonna put it back on the transport. Um, and it uses the transport delay capabilities, which with RabbitMQ requires that, um, that the delayed exchange plugin to be installed. So that's how I'm configuring the retry. And just like consumers and sagas, it applies to activities. Typically when an activity throws an exception, the routing slip faults. It does not go through retry. The message does not go to an error queue. The routing slip faults and the routing slip faulted event is produced. So, one of the common things people see is like, well, I'm not seeing anything in my error queue. Well, that's because activities and routing slip activities don't use an error queue because they're meant to complete or fail as an entire transaction. So that's why we have compensation. If activities need to be compensated, they compensate. But the expectation is that it runs from start to finish without exceptions and completes. Otherwise it rolls back, compensates any activities with compensation, and then produces that routing slip faulted event. So keep that in mind when you're thinking about this, it's meant to be one long distributed operation across multiple activities and not just like, oh, I'm gonna have steps and I'm just gonna have steps and steps. So if any of those individual activities need to retry, that's why we would use these retries to deal with transient conditions. Uh, yeah, so that's just an important thing to keep in mind. So that's how we handle errors. And as we were able to see, it did recover from that. And now if I, come in here and put danger back in, I'll actually get to see a extended length trace, which if we go back and look, we can see now we have like a 32 element trace. And this one actually comes down and I know this like goes on forever. The depth on this is crazy. But now we can see that the process payment, the first time it comes in, we received it, or the first times it comes in, we received it, we immediately threw that exception, we went to redelivery, we sent it back out to the queue. I mean, you can see, well, sort of, that the details in here of, you know, the payload size, the messaging, the routing slip being sent back out, what the destination is, all of that information is in there. We received that 500 milliseconds later, we go to process it, we then do the X sign waiver. So nothing was lost. That modified routing slip that had that dynamic activity added at the end, even though we retried a previous activity, all of that routing slip information is retained because all of that state is in the routing slip, which is on the message broker. So it's in that durable queue. So we didn't lose anything, we didn't change anything. We just kept that all around. So that's how we handle exceptions. That's how we dynamically modify routing slips to kind of advanced features. Um, but dealing with exceptions is important, especially, you know, so we don't have to go and put like a poly or a retry policy into our actual activity to communicate with external services. So something to keep in mind there. So thanks for joining. There might be more to come. I'm wrapping up this series pretty soon, but uh, definitely give me some feedback. Add some comments below if you have questions or if there's other aspects of the routing slip you'd like to see. Um, always subscribe because you'll get the video notifications the fastest and, uh, you know, like all that stuff. So thanks for joining. There's uh, more to come and uh, we'll catch you in the next episode.